Hello, I'm here finally. Welcome back to the tennis vlog. Hit subscribe if you haven't already subscribed to the channel and you will stay up to date with everything that happens. It's been a busier week than usual here because it's had to be, it's a grand slam. Got to keep on top of things. Uh, this is the least I've been prepared for a live video so far, hence being late. Uh, haven't checked the drawers. I'm just about on top of the results, not to put you off watching because there's tons to talk about and I've kept on top of a lot of what's going on. So I hope you've brought your questions and we can get into the usual. Not taking my scarf off because it's freezing cold and I know it doesn't tie in with Melbourne and the soaring temperature in Australia, but it's Great Britain, we have to make do. So, uh, thank you to those who are here. I understand that some people won't be able to make it. It's not a good time, really. Uh, but I, a busy couple of days yesterday and today and didn't even know when to sleep, to be honest. So this is just when I could fit things in and that's what we're going to have to go with for today. We'll potentially do another one after the fourth round, but really it depends whether you would rather have a live stream Q&A after the fourth round or quarterfinal preview and predictions because I wouldn't have the time to do both. So for me personally, it's easier to do this, but for the channel and stats and stuff, um, preview and predictions would probably be better. So let me know what you would prefer. Um, but without any further ado, she says as she looks for something she wants to get up. Where are we? Here we go. Let's get into the key results of the third round. So, still running low on major upsets, to be honest, um, especially on the women's side. I mean, you look at the US Open for the women, there were a ton of upsets in round one, but here we are at the third round and there have not been any really high profile names knocked off. Uh, some of them have been pushed close. Naomi Osaka was pushed to three sets by Su Wei She earlier today. Venus Williams beaten by Simona Halep a few hours ago, but Venus wasn't seeded and Halep is the world number one. Someone had to lose. So that's that one. And um, to let me know what you think the biggest upset was, because I think we lost someone on the men's side that was more high profile, but I mean, they're all doing rather well. Nishikori, who fought through his first couple of rounds, is still going. David Goffa, 21st seed, but he was beaten by Daniel Medvedev, who is to um, in the top 15 now, seedings-wise. Uh, Milos Raonic still rolling. So, yeah, even on the men's side, I mean, there have been some seeded players go. Fabio Fanini, 12th seed earlier today. Pablo Caroni Busta beat him. But... Yeah, the distinct lack of upsets. Uh, credit to the top players because they've really been handling themselves well. Hi. Yeah, drop a comment and say hi if you're watching. Uh, nice to know who's around. Um, yeah, so rolling through are Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal again. Novak Djokovic dropped a set to Denis Shapovalov. That was always going to be a tough match. The talent Shapovalov brings. He was obviously majorly hyped. Uh, back in 2017 when he beat Rafael Nadal at home in Canada and uh, he's got a lot going on in his game so I'm not surprised that Djokovic was pushed a little there but I'm also not surprised that he rolled through a six love fourth set the way he can rebound and has such mental brilliance is is really impressive so uh, good for Djokovic oh obviously Caroline Wozniacki that was the biggest women's upset so that wasn't this tonight or today wherever you are that was uh the first day of round three she lost to Sharapova so as okay hmm I guess some people would call it an upset some wouldn't obviously it's an upset by seeding but Sharapova has more Grand Slam titles has been um obviously world number one previously um who led their head to head 6-4 ahead of the clash so Wozniacki knew going into that match that it could be game over for her title defense and it was so credit to Sharapova for pulling that one off um I, I didn't catch the whole match I looked at the stats a uh, very high number of unforced errors from Sharapova but clearly and I yeah I watched a whole highlights reel and stuff to see what was going on. She was hitting some great winners. She was looking better than I've seen her look in a long time. And she was looking more comfortable. 
confident, comfortable, comfortable. Is that like a mix of the two? But yeah, she was looking more comfortable than I've seen her. Uh, I mean, she showed promise in the early rounds because um, she uh, double bageled, obviously, Harriet Dart. Um, but in her first two rounds, it wasn't a stiff competition. So it was hard to judge really where she was at. But against Wozniacki, you know, that is a good win. Uh, she stepped up, dictated. That was exactly what she had to do. And yeah, she she did what she needed to do and her half of the draw, a lot of the top players on her half happen to be counter punchers, which is very positive for Sharapova because I think if she came up against, well, for Serena, for example, who's dominated her for years, I don't think she would be guessing any further. There are some key power players in the other half of the draw, Naomi Osaka, Gabini Muguruza, who I think she would really struggle against. So I positive for Sharapova where she's placed at the moment and the players she's looking at facing coming up. So yeah, uh, Wozniacki's exit, definitely the biggest upset on the women's side. But Irina Sabalenka as well, you know, that was surprising because a lot of people, including myself, had her down as an outside contender. Now I had her down as a contender. I didn't actually think she'd win the tournament because I don't think she's quite there yet in terms terms of she's got a great game, but I don't think she would have been able to produce that consistently for seven straight matches. And she was at Amanda Anisimova, who obviously came onto the scene last year, really, as a 16-year-old. Incredible power that she gets. I mean, she's a she's quite um quite a small girl really she's not she's not incredibly muscly or anything and yet the power through timing that she can get on that ball is better than I've seen in any young player in a long time really and it's not just the odd flash it's consistent as well and there are a lot of players on tour like for example Yelena Ostapenko who are going for winners early who are going to dictate early and that's kind of the popular game style at the moment but the difference with Anissa Mova is that she actually nails her marks and executes it on the majority of occasions she's not going all out and making an absolute ton of unforced errors as well as a lot of winners she's actually finding her marks and even on the run looking incredibly comfortable I was very impressed by that win from her obviously we know what she's capable of because she beat Petra Kvita last year then she had a spell of injury and other players rose up in her absence but Anissa Mova definitely wants to keep an eye on there are other young players rising up who just don't have that same precision and that same firepower that she has and she has a really good serve as well really fast um she could add more elements to her game but she she couldn't she did mix it up when she needed to against Sabalenka the thing was she was so precise with the way she was dictating that she was outlasting Sabalenka a lot of the time so that was another, they, they were the two main big exits, I think, on the women's side. Um, oh, Marin Cilic pushing through uh, yesterday against Fernando Vadasco in that five setter. He was on the brink. Vadasco served that double fault on match points in the fourth set tiebreak. You know, even when Vadasco was two sets to love up, I thought he would lose in five. Because however talented the guy is, however much firepower he can play with, however precise he is moving up to the net and doing all those kinds of things during a match, you know that he can get cold at any second. And that's exactly what happens against Marin Cilic, who obviously has played great tennis here. I think it's impressive mentally from Cilic because he's he was defending final points. Um, he was playing an opponent who was in the zone at that point. And both of them, really great rallies from the baseline. The the backhands from both of them, especially Cilic's backhand cross court was devastating. He was when he was put under the most pressure, that was when he produced his highest level. And I was very impressed. And I think coming through that match makes him a stronger and more intimidating opponent for whoever comes next. He's on track to face Roger Federer in the quarterfinals. So that could be interesting. Um, what will be more interesting is um, Nadal versus Burdic in the fourth round before that. So let me know if you have thoughts. Great win again for Petra Kvitova, who's never been a good performer. Over, well, has been previously, but over the past few years, she's just struggled to perform full stop in Australia. Uh, but to come past Belinda Bencic as easily as she did, I had Bencic down as a dark horse for this tournament. She's coming back into form. She's been top 10, had wins over top players for some reason, whatever it may be. I mean, I, I don't see anything particularly a, the, about her game that stands out compared to other players, but they just find her really difficult. She's um, She's consistent from the baseline. She can play from all areas of the court. 
And players struggle with that, but not Kvitova on that given day. She was absolutely fine with it. So credit to her for still going strong. Now, enough of me rambling, except for the fact that, you see, I'm going down these results and I remember these results. I remember them happening. I remember watching a lot of them. <laughs> I'm so tired at this point that it takes me looking at them to actually remember when and where they occurred. So I'm seeing these things now. For example, um, where are we? Kashinov. Uh, was beaten and Kachanov was the 10th seed, beaten by Roberto Bautista Agut, who finally got the straight sets win that he deserved after uh, leading by two sets in two matches and his opponent coming back with the full backing of the crowd. Very good for him. He's one of the most informed players at the moment. It will be a big test when he comes up, if he comes up against a top player. But um, I'm, I'm enjoying watching Bautista Agut at the moment. He's doing great stuff um, from the baseline and really performing with such a mental strength that I don't always see from him. So yeah, good for him. And uh, I'm not going to look down any more results before I talk about too much and don't get around to answering your questions. So thank you. They've seen they've been coming in a bit. So let's get let's get to it. Um, don't want to miss any. So I'm going to scroll back up. Thoughts on Ashley Barty? She's the dark horse in this tournament for me, says someone. If you watched my last stream, you'd have heard me say that one of my sisters actually predicted her to win the whole tournament. Um, I wouldn't re be ready to go that far. I think, I mean, she plays Maria Sharapova next, and if she's not on her game, then I think Sharapova will get the win there because um, Sharapova's looking very confident. Barty can unravel in tough situations, despite the fact that, in my opinion, she has one of the best repertoires on tour. She has a lot going for her. She's got the net game. She's got the backhand slice. She's got the ability to hit cleanly. Um, she can work her way past people at the net. A lot of experience thanks to how great she was on, in doubles at such a young age. She was in Grand Slam finals at the age of 17. Uh, in doubles with Casey Delacqua. So, uh, yeah, she's got a great game. Uh, it's all about the head game, I think, with Barty, uh, her movement as well as key, and her ability to be consistent when faced with a lot of power coming her way. Now, I think she has an incredible amount of talent. I remember her winning Junior Wimbledon at, at the age of 15. Everyone was hyping her up. That got to her in that she couldn't really handle the pressure and wasn't enjoying tennis anymore, gave up, and this seems like ages ago now, but she actually dropped the sport and went to play cricket instead, which wasn't the original reason that she dropped, stopped playing tennis, but that opportunity came up. Uh, I actually got the first interview with her when she came back to tour because she happened to be playing at a tournament I go to most years, and I saw her name in the qualifying draw, and there's a lot of local press at that particular tournament, and. Uh, I knew that no one else would really be interested in talking to her. So went in there and it was great to be able to catch up on what she'd been up to and why she came back. And she seemed so refreshed and so motivated. And I've caught up with her each year since and she's made steady progression, which is awesome. She She's really been finding her groove and embracing the... I mean, because there's still pressure, but she's embracing it rather than feeling weighed down by it, which is so key for her situation. Um, yeah, so she, I think she's a phenomenal talent. I think she's a great person, a uh, lovely girl. And she has the talent and the ability to take down Sharapova and players after her. She is in the better section of the draw, but it all comes down to her consistency, her mental strength on the on the give day. The Australian crowd have been amazing for their players. She needs to use that rather than let that get her nervous, I guess, because I think the crowd have been playing a, a lot, a good role in the, the results of some of the Aussies. Alex Bolt, for example, on the men's side, who came and beat Gilles Simon in five sets. Bolt is not the most talented player you're going to see, but he kind of rose up on the occasion and uh, was was really competing with intensity and that you could see the energy of the crowd coming through his game. And I, I think it actually makes a lot of difference for the players. So Barty can use that to her advantage. Uh, yeah, she's she's great. And obviously there are things she could improve. She could get her serve in a more dominant position. But I mean, in terms of at the net, I'd say she's probably, I mean, her, her ability at the net is great. She's got great control. She's got good placement with it. It's she needs to make sure she's not pushed around. So maybe adopt use her use her tools and her weapons, obviously, but maybe adopt a more aggressive approach. 
Uh, I don't feel like, unless Sharapova's having an off day, she can't really afford to let them push her around too much. Uh, she wants, she needs some some control in the match, I think. Um, is Sharapova ready to take any slam this year? Um, I never write players off. I always thought that when Sharapova came back, even though throughout her career, I have to be honest, I think I thought she was underrated, overrated even, flipping neck. I mean, yeah, she's won five slams, sure, but she's never, until she won her second French Open, she'd won one at each slam. Uh, some people said that showed versatility. I thought it showed inconsistency. So but the year prior to her ban, she'd actually started losing to a lot of players that she wouldn't usually. And I thought, oh, she's going through a rough patch here. And then she got the ban and was off for a while and everyone was saying I mean the the drama that gets thrown around these kind of things all these people saying oh she'll never come back that's it she's done and I was like what really I mean you don't get I mean she's obviously so competitive and so hungry you don't see a player like that who's I mean she wasn't even in her 30s at that point even if she'd got a four-year ban she'd have been about 33 when when the ban was up she I mean she was always going to come back you could tell that she wasn't done and when a player isn't done and is that hungry and has achieved before what they have as well as their physical game is their their name uh, and you kind of when you're playing that kind of player you have to first beat them physically and then beat them mentally so, and I feel like maybe it's not as bad now because Sharapova hasn't been in as great form and hasn't had as good results, but there definitely used to be a thing when players faced Sharapova where they were playing her name as much as they were playing her as a competitor and as a player. I know what Sharapova does really well or did do really well was grind her way through three sets. Now there's controversy and discussion as to why that was, um, but you can't deny her fighting spirit. So she would never be my top pick to win a slam. Um, a few years ago, because of these different aspects to her as a player, she would always have been up there for me as a contender. But now nowadays, I wouldn't choose to put her up there because, for example, she was been playing decently in recent tournaments or the US Open, for example, she won a couple of rounds. And for me, it was kind of just prolonging the inevitable. I knew she'd come up against one match or come into one match situation against a certain player, whoever that might be, where even though she'd looked promising before, it just wouldn't work for her on that day. That just seems to be what happens to her at the moment. Uh, I have a better feeling about her this tournament. She seems more at ease. She seems more like the Sharap over of old, really. So... Um, is she ready to take an A-slam this year? Honestly, if the, if it opens up for her, then she can do it. Would she need a bit of help? Maybe. I think she's got, as I've said, a decent draw here. Got the counter punches, which is, would be her preference. So, yeah, we'll see. But, I mean, she's done it before. Nothing to stop her doing it again. <laughs> okay. Okay, someone says, I said Halep was well capable of beating Venus in two sets. Um, clearly, yes, because she beat her last time they played in two sets. And sure enough, I think she can beat Serena. If she wins this slam with that nightmare of a draw, she deserves everyone's respect. 100%. I mean, that quarter containing Serena, Venus, Halep, Muguruza as well, I think. Absolute nightmare. Absolute nightmare. It had Conta in too, if I'm guessing that correctly, and Muguruza Conta were in that section. They might be in Osaka's. But I'm not going to check now. It'll take too long. Um, but, yeah. Halep. I wouldn't say she played particularly amazingly against Venus. That At the beginning of that match, it looked like it was going to be a really good one. Uh, Venus landing blows early, knowing she had to be aggressive and dictate, landing her backhand and doing incredibly well with striking deep on the baseline. Um, Halep combating well, you know, with her defense, getting deep shots in herself. The depth from both of them was pretty good. Uh, but at the end of the day, it came down to Venus on forced errors as much as anything. She had chances she didn't take because she just wasn't consistent enough. And that was the thing. It was always going to be about which one of them could execute their own game plan more consistently. And that was Halep. Uh, she was there for the big moments to capitalize, take opportunities. Venus just wasn't. And it's a shame for her because she was going after it. And when she landed that backhand today, Venus, it was very, very impressive. She was wrong footing. She was dictating cross court. It was great. But it's nothing without consistency. So big mental win for Halep to come through. 
Uh, looking ahead to Halep versus Serena, I mean, Serena's not being troubled, full stop. Uh, three thrashings, essentially, against Tatiana Maria, Eugenie Bouchard, and Diana Yostremska, who's, um, yeah, who has quite a basic game, really, and I didn't expect Serena to be troubled there at all. So you've got the two comparisons of Halep, who has struggled through, and Serena, who's soared through, but the difference is Halep has faced tougher opposition. Halep's faced Kaya Kanepi, who beat her at the US Open in round one. She's now just faced Venus Williams, the seven-time Grand Slam champion. Serena's faced um, she's faced Tatiana Maria, who's been con a consistent presence on tour but never really achieved much. Eugenie Bouchard, who's essentially been nowhere since 2015. And Diana Yastrzemska, who's far from the best of the younger players on tour. So Serena just hasn't had the same quality op of opposition that Halep has had. So is that going to hurt her when they face off? Potentially. I mean, Serena's up there in their head-to-head. -head. She Halep thrashed her that one time at the WTA finals. But, I mean, in general, in general, this is the kind of player Serena likes to face. Someone she can literally just smash with her power. Um, whereas Halep kind of needs Serena to be off a bit in order to get on top of things and she needs to be aggressive herself. It's not necessarily her instinct to play like that, but she can do that. She can absorb power and use her timing and that's what she needs to do, come forward if she can. Um, but I think it's going to help Halep, even though it might have spent more of her energy, that she was pushed harder in rounds one and two, that she has got that confidence-boosting win in round three. Uh, the mental aspects is very important. Serena could do with the, could have done with being tested a bit more. She there are slams where she's soared through and basically there was one time I think at the Australian Open she maybe dropped 21 games, 17 games on the way to the title. Um but traditionally in a lot of tournaments Serena will have one match early on where she's pushed hard and comes through and then it's kind of like a beeline to the trophy. Uh she hasn't had this time around so that could be an issue if she comes up against Halep and gets pushed a bit closer. How will she handle that? But, you know, she's, I mean, hard to argue with her form. She won the Australian Open, took a break due to pregnancy and has reached the final of both Grand Slams that she's played since. She's here for these big events and she has looked mightily impressive during her first three wins, things to work on things that Halep could take advantage of with her experience playing Serena especially. So yeah, it has the potential be to it has the potential to be an interesting match. I would be taking Serena because at the beginning of the tournament I predicted her to win the whole thing. Um but I mean Halep has the the mental hmm does she though? I I think she does. I think because she's done it before, there's that different mentality for Halep going into the match than say a player that's never faced Serena before or a player that's faced Serena time and time again for a long time and not got a win. I think for Halep, there's a different perspective going into the match and I think that will help her. And so there is a potential for it to be close, but I, I would be, if I had to choose someone, I would be picking Serena to come through. Um, huh, chances of Serena beating Halep. I answered these questions before before I scroll down to them. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not, but yeah, um, strong chances. I'd say Serena has the greater chances of coming through than Halep, but then Halep made the final here last year, obviously feels at home in these conditions. I was concerned about Halep and how she would cope without Darren Cahill because he has been instrumental, that that team effort in getting Halep to the results and the position in the rankings that she's got. But she's, you know, she's done well, even if she hasn't produced her best tennis in the first round, the second round, she's done well to still come through them. It shows the mental edge that those top players are supposed to have. Mm -hmm. Are Nishikori's chances hampered a bit after first two rounds? I'm going to pull this over here. It probably looks really weird when I'm looking down. Um, are Nishikori's chances hampered a bit after first two rounds, as he now has to face Karunio Buston next, and possibly Novak Djokovic after that? Saw him hitting his thighs a bit in the third set today. I mean, it's a shame for Nishikori because we know how much he struggles with injury and 
his style is to do a lot of court coverage last in the longer rallies. He's not always going for winners particularly early. Yes, he can play from all areas of the court. He's probably one of the players on tour with the fullest game and the most weapons to his game. But uh, he doesn't always play in the smartest way for his body. So obviously it's always easier for the players if they can come through without having a mammoth fight. Um, it's now something he just has to deal with. I, I wouldn't call Pablo Carreño Busta to upset him, to be honest. I think um, he, he's been short on good results, Carreño Busta himself, recently. And Nishikori was more convincing in that latest win. So Djokovic would be the biggest th threat, really. <laughs> I mean, it goes without saying, it's Novak Djokovic, he's in form. So I think... Yeah, Djokovic would Djokovic would be the tough one, and I think that Nishikori might just edge it out to get there. But as you say, it does depend on his the state of his body, how he's feeling physically. I don't know that. I I can't say. So yeah, that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. How do you rate Milos' game so far? This is Milos Raonic. Looks like he's back in top form, definitely. Do you see anyone else apart from the big three winning the whole thing? If yes, who would your pick be? Um, I missed Ranich last match. What I've seen from him, he's been tremendous. Um, as I've said before, 2016, Ranich looked scary good. His mental state seemed to be in an amazing place. After the Wimbledon final that he lost to Murray, he vowed to be fitter, better, faster, la di da di da And... It was. I was kind of sat there thinking, Milos Raonic is coming. He he is guessing up there, but he had injuries, you know, and that kind of halted his momentum. And since then, he struggled. But he's always had the talent. The thing with talent is it never dies. That your talent stays there even when your body is is failing and not able to produce. And um, Raonic still has a long way ahead of him in his career. He's got a lot more years to go. So he's just got, he's getting that court time now in order to produce his best game. And the serve is instrumental because when he's landing that serve with the variety on it, with the pace on it, he's immediately setting himself up to mainly come to the net at the moment. The, him and Thomas Burdick both are using their net game a lot to follow up behind those big serves. Uh, both of them bear similarities actually over the years in terms of their results, in terms of the fact they've been ranked near the top, they've got wins over the top players but they haven't yet broken through to win a slam, looking less likely for Burdich now in the latter stages of his career but Raonic is that bit younger, there's still opportunities. So apart from the big three, I would have said... I would have said Vavrinka, based on his history at this event, the fact that he's pushed Djokovic so close before, the fact he won his maiden slam here as a real dark horse. But, I mean, he wasn't in good form coming into the event. I'm not surprised that he lost to Raonic in the second round, um, even though that one was close. So if it weren't to be any of the big three... I think Raonic has a fighting chance, given the way he's playing, if he can sustain that. But the biggest test for him would be Djokovic, because in the past, however well he's been playing, Djokovic has always seemed to be a problem for him. And Djokovic is so good on the return. So these big servers, naturally, their biggest weapon is their serve. And someone like Djokovic, who's so brilliant on the return, can really neutralize that in a way that other players can't. So that would be the biggest test for him because it would be more a test of his ground stroke game. If he's going to commit to come to the net more, that's going to give him more chance because even when he's got his serve in, he's, he's trying to, to hate from the offset. Djokovic doesn't have the chance to land a deep return and get on even footing in the rally. So I think, yeah, I think Ranic has a good shot. I'm just thinking, um, which is hard for me at the moment. I've got like a woolly head. Not enough sleep, even though I did miss some matches that I should have watched due to the fact that I couldn't cope anymore. So, hmm. Yeah, Raonic shouts out. Let me know what you think. If you're not picking one of the big three to win, who are you going for and why? Let me know in the chat and I will have a look to see what you think. Uh, but Raonic very convincing at the moment. And on the better half of the jaw as well. I mean, on Federer and Nadal's side, you've got 
Chilic as well. I mean, Chilic always has a chance. He's won a slam before. He's been greatly consistent at the slams, reaching the Australian Open final, the Wimbledon final, giving himself opportunities. So I wouldn't look past Chilic either, especially with the way he was hitting his backhand. But Raonic, as long as he has the mental game, because that's big when you haven't won a slam before, um, I think he's got a shot. Um... Three rounds done, which WTA and ATP player would you say played best during week one? Now, um, it's sometimes a bit difficult to say on this um, because it depends on the opposition they faced as well. So I think that Rafael Nadal has played incredibly so far in the pressure moments. He's unleashed the forehand, the serve come forward, pinpointed his opponents when they're trying to serve and volley, got his placement right, kind of risen to the occasion. But at the same time, he's faced three Aussies who he was definitely the favourite to beat. So, I mean, for example, Djokovic has dropped a set, yes, but in Shapovalov he had a tougher draw than Nadal did when he was facing Dimonor, I think. I mean, Alex de Menor is fantastic. He's got the great court coverage, um, brilliant at the net, obviously, and he could run around all day and just not seem to get tired. But Shapovalov has more top wins than, than de Menor and has kind of been on the ATP scene that bit longer. So, but I mean, at the same time, you know, even though Nadal beat de Menor by the exact same scoreline as he beat him at Wimbledon last year, he was pushed in those opening stages that looked like the match would be a lot closer than it was. But Nadal just made sure to win those key points and throw seeds of doubt into de Menor's mind. He's brilliant at doing that because the slightest opportunity and he will take it. These top players have such a sense for the big moments and a confidence to execute in them. And that really... You could see it crushing Diminor, even though he was still throwing the kitchen sink at him. He was really going for it and executed some brilliant shots. Those magnificent winners and well-constructed points just didn't come at the correct moments to get him up on that scoreboard. Whereas Nadal would bring out brilliance and efficiency in at moments in the match where it was going to get him further ahead. So that made the difference there. So I think Nadal's been in great form. Federer, great serving display against Taylor Fritz, didn't face a break point. Um, I think that Federer has not been stunning early on, but he's, um, I think efficient is the word. He's not really seemed to have to exert himself. He's done what he, he needed to to get through against Dan Evans in the second round. That was very, very high quality. Um, Evans was going toe to toe with him. And yeah, to be honest, uh, at points in that match, he was under pressure. But at the same time, despite the pressure, he seems pretty relaxed. I mean, if you can be, both of them seem pretty laid back. They seem to be enjoying the match, even though they were really pushing each other and moving each other around and sending each other to each side of the court coming forwards um yeah it was it was really impressive from both of them so i think uh nadal and federer have been very consistent uh Raonic obviously uh, i mean i know i'm only supposed to pick one but i don't think i can single one out because of the differences in draws uh but milos Raonic very impressive and thomas burdich i think very much overlooked in terms of he's been having great results so uh, his match with Nadal, I think, could be tough because if he's landing a serve, Nadal's had trouble with Burdich here before, lost to him in the quarterfinals as recently as 2015. And that was in straight sets. So that could be a difficult one for Nadal. And then on the women's side, ooh, interesting question. I mean, I have to say Serena plainly because she's just steamrolled through. Um, she hasn't had that test that battle um to show where her mental mental game is at but i mean at the same time does she need to we've serena is like she used to be the queen of comebacks we've seen her be on the brink of defeat and just raise her game raise her intensity absolutely just whack the ball and land the winners you know so i i think that yeah, Serena has been the most impressive that I've seen in terms of consistent performances. But Amanda Anisimova, you know, has has not dropped many games at all. I think she's dropped she's she's dropped like a handful of games in the last two matches combined. And uh let's see, because she played obviously Irina Sabalenka in the last round. And then before that, it was 
Um, yeah, Lazy Serenko, who's, I mean, I feel like she's overrated. A lot of people talk complimentary about Serenko's game and things they like about it. And uh, to me, she just doesn't really stand out. But I mean, a 6 love 6 2 win over the 24th seed as, as an unseeded 17 year old is deeply impressive to back that up then with a 6 3 6 2 defeat of Sabalenka, which I don't think was a thrashing from what I saw. I thought actually they were going toe to toe and. Enisimova would just had that that bit more consistency than Sabalenka was very calm and what was noticeable about that match is that I mean whether you like talking about it or not so Sabalenka as much as I I love watching her game and I think she's awesome as a player makes a horrendous noise when she's hitting that ball and yet Enisimova was arguably hitting more powerfully hitting more strongly even on the run and she barely made a murmur literally so it does make you ask questions about that kind of thing but yeah, Anisimova also beat Monica Nikulescu in straight sets in round one, and Nikulescu uh, tricky with the drop, so drop shots, backhand slice, squat shots as well. Squash shots, squat shots. I mean, squat shots are like what Radwanska did when she crouched right down. Uh, but yeah, she's she's been impressive and plays Petra Kvitova next, who she beat last year. So that will be a great match for both of them because both Kvitova and Anisimova looking in good form. Kerber as well. Kerber was my instinct picks to win the tournaments before I just went with Serena because I never underestimate her were either Kerber or Osaka which I could never have imagined saying a few months ago but no I thought really instinctively that Kerber might win it and she looked to have her hands full early on against Australian wildcard Kimberly Birold who was just going for it and really striking a very heavy ball but you know, Kerber's pace, her angles, the the things she does strategically to get herself on the front foot on the losing side of a rally. Uh, brilliant, really good stuff. So there are a lot of women actually looking quite impressive and credit to them for not having as many upsets because usually um, you can look to the women's side of things and think, you guarantee pretty much there are going to be a lot of people um, getting upset early on but they're not this time so credit to them it's been a great tournament so far someone thinks Nadal will win this year well in his form at the moment he definitely has a good shot uh I would be interested to see him play Federer at the moment just to see where his game how his game matches up to him as opposed to two years ago I mean because in 2017 I think Federer beat him four times maybe five but I think it was four so Right, it was a good matchup for Simona Halep, no question, but it was ultra professional. This is someone else talking, not me. It reminded me of her win against Elise Mertens at the French Open last year when she started clicking. Yeah, I, you could see the confidence and honestly, I was getting drowsy towards the end of the match, but I could tell the direction it was going in purely because of where Halep's mental game was at that point in time. So... Yeah, very, very confidence boosting for her, and she means business, no doubt about it. Um... Lost my place again, I keep doing this. Doo -doo. Right, here we are. Okay. Someone saying Nadal versus Djokovic final. What are your predictions for a final? Let me know. Uh, I can see that happening, but I wouldn't predict it myself. Given how Roger Federer often looked amazing in early rounds of slams before crumbling in later stages last year, is it likely that he could be in for an upset? That's a very good point. Um, when people were saying at the US Open, like I would talk to people on the radio and they'd be saying, oh, Federer stormed through that match, he was looking in form, but I could see the unforced errors and the the forgivingness of his opponents and the lack of consistency and I was never convinced. This time around, from what I've seen, I, I missed the majority of his match with Fritz. I don't think it has the same feel to it as there was at the US Open, as at Wimbledon. I, I think he does look a lot more secure and maybe that's due to the opponents he's faced, but especially in that Evans match, you know, when he produced a very high quality and then was the player who upped it in the key moments. I think that was very impressive and very, I can't think of the word I want, but um, he, yeah, he, he looked solid and 
you know, it could happen. It could happen because the thing Federer has struggled with is the the mental strength and producing consistently. Uh, but I think that obviously I think Chilic will be the next big test for him. And I, I would expect him to come through that. And if he does, then, you know, he's in great position to potentially take on Nadal and potentially make the final. And I, I did think at the beginning of the event that his toughest test would be Novak Djokovic because with their rivalry and the things that have gone down even recently, there is that mental aspect as well. Before his break in 2016, that mental barrier really came to the fore when jo uh, Federer would take on Djokovic in major finals, for example. So, yes, that's the answer there. I wouldn't go as far as to say Simona Halep is on fire, to be honest. Um, I think she's she's shown... I mean, she made a ton of unforced errors today when she could actually have gone up even more easily on Venus. Like, her forehand seemed to fall apart at times. So I, I wouldn't say she's on fire, but uh, she she's fought through when she's not necessarily been playing her best, I think. Um, on the WTA, Angelique Kerber is strong. She can win in 2016. She did win in 2016, didn't she? That was her a, a first slam, which was incredible, really, because I remember watching Kerber in 2011 lose to Laura Robson in the first round of Wimbledon. I, it's just one of those ones you wouldn't have expected her to come through and suddenly win like this. Um... Milos Ranić versus Alexander Zverev thoughts. My first thought is that is that really the next round? I completely lost track there, but it potentially Alexander Zverev. Let's put it in. It is indeed. So why are we talking about Ranić facing Djokovic when he has to play faces of Zverev first? Well, it's probably because Zverev still isn't convincing at slams. Uh, I. Did not have Zverev down to go deep. I thought he would be an early upset again because I still don't think he's quite there in order to in order to win the majors. But I mean, credit to him. Um, still going. Let's see. He's beaten Elias Bedene, decent win in straights. Jeremy Chardy pushed him to five when he should have won more quickly. And then Alex Bolt. I mean, credit to him for coming past Gilles Simon, but he could definitely have had a tougher opponent in that third round. And I thought that Simon was probably going to get there and push him close. So I would be taking Raonic there for the upsets. Upsets. I mean, Raonic has been around and being successful longer than Zverev, even though I do believe Zverev will win more slams and be a bigger name by the time he's done. So... Yeah, my thoughts on that one, it could be great tennis, uh, a good mix. I think it'll test Zverev's return game, which isn't the best on tour. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd take Ronic to come through that one. Let me... Like, hey, Simran. Uh, let me... <laughs> yeah, let me know if you agree. Let me know, because I, I, can, I can see arguments for Zverev potentially coming through, but Ronic has just been so so powerful, so great at his execution and so confident. And he's just looking back to the form he was in in 2016. Um, right, Serena is the favorite, but if Simona Halep shows up, she can take it. Halep versus Williams and Berdic versus Nadella, the picks of the fourth round. I would say so, yes. Also, um, Raonic versus Zverev could potentially be good. Who's Djokovic playing? I've lost track. So Djokovic just beat um, Shapovalov. And now faces Daniel Medvedev. Now that could be good. Medvedev in decent form. <laughs> um, mm, just kind of lost where I was then. Okay, how does Nadal keep bouncing back on fast hard courts? He looked done on hard courts three or four years ago, and here he is again. That's a legend for you. That's a champion for you. When Nadal was having a tough time in 2015, 
there was the <laughs> I, I don't know if he'll even be watching the stream maybe but there was this one guy on twitter that would come on to me like every two three days maybe every week telling me that Nadal was done and I was clearly biased for saying that he wasn't done and that he would win more slams which was so frustrating to me because I was convinced that it was just a blip in form and that he was going to win more slams and that People are so quick to write these players off. We've seen it with Federer, we've seen it with Djokovic more recently. People just want these guys gone. I don't understand why, because they're the best thing to happen to tennis in a long time, if not ever. But the people just want drama, they want a story, and they were all writing Nadal off. And the thing is, he he's so competitive and so hungry for more that he has adjust things. His backhand after 2015, he improved it so much more in order to get himself back into a fighting position. And due to the fact he was making these improvements, um, he just got he just got got rid of the injuries first of all, and then was getting more confidence boosting wins. And when Nadal is confident, that's the groundwork for him to be able to unleash to be able to unleash the forehand, to dictate, to use the serve, to, to optimise the weapons in his game that have made him such a fearsome opponent for so long. So it was all like a mentality confidence struggle, I think, for Nadal in 2015, plus a few injuries. So how does Nadal keep bouncing back on hard courts? Because he can play on hard courts. I mean, people talk him down on the surface because he's been so successful on clay. I mean, all those French Open titles, who can argue with it? But he, I mean, he's won multiple US Open titles. He's won the Australian Open before. He's won Indian Wells. He's done good stuff on hard courts. He's beaten the best players on hard courts. I don't know why people have this. It's like when people talk down Roger Federer on clay and say that Federer is bad on clay. Federer's won the French Open and he was hanging in there waiting for his opportunity. You know, he's won he's won clay court masters as well. So I think people just have these perceived opinions that because a player is great here, that because they're not so good here, they're just not good. Uh, I mean, it, it's dramatic. I, th I think that Nadal is better on hard courts than anyone gives him credit for. Um, what's your take on Camille Giorgi versus Karolina Pliskova match? Uh, because I've been busy and I had commitments that I had to go out for, I didn't actually watch this match. When I saw it written down, I I didn't agree with it being on Rod Laver Arena because who wouldn't schedule Simona Hallett versus Venus Williams on the main court? I don't understand. But it obviously had the potential to be good. You've got Giorgi with... Her hot and coldness, yeah, but yes, but her firepower and her ability when she's on, she obviously obviously had a good deep run at Wimbledon and gave Serena the run around as well. And then you've got Pliskova, who you never quite know what she's going to do, and if her serve is off, then anything is possible. Um, I always found Pliskova more interesting to watch in person because you can see the spin and the different effects that she's using better than you can on TV. Um, sometimes I, I would understand if people found her a bit boring to watch on TV. Uh, but yeah, that definitely had all the potential to be close and clearly it was and it's a great thing for Pliskova that she was able to come through that one and fight through. It shows um, that she's in a car... Well, it's confidence boosting for her, but um, as well, it's like it's not always one of those matches that she would be able to to win if it was at a lower tournament, maybe... Maybe she wouldn't manage it, but yeah, good good focus from Pliskova. Uh, it probably gets tougher for Pliskova now. Yeah, Garbini Muguruza versus Karolina Pliskova in the next round. So that one will be really interesting um, to see whether... I mean, Muguruza's finding her form now. She backs up that win over Johanna Conta, which was one of the most high quality women's matches I've seen in my life, if not the most high quality, when you're looking at both the players involved. Um, great winners to win for Steras, the differential, zero double faults for the entire three set match. Mikarutha wasn't broken once. I, I can't remember the exact number, but there was an insane number of consecutive service holds. Mikarutha broke at the beginning of the match and she broke at the end of the match and she was never broken herself. That does not happen on the women's tour. It literally doesn't. You watch a women's match and you can expect to see at least probably about four breaks of serve in each set. 
I mean, for that to happen is phenomenal and absolute credit to them. It was a brilliant, brilliant match and one of the best matches I've seen at the tournament, men's or women's, although there have been a lot of great five setters on the men's side. So I tweeted earlier, what I've loved about this tournament is the, the renewed consistency of the top seeded players on the women's side and the five setters on the men's side. It's been a great display of great tennis and um, <laughs> despite the lack of sleep I've had, I have very much enjoyed it. Um, someone's unhappy that Eurosport one, Eurosport one showed Pui Popper, Popperin. I've got, I've got the correct pronunciation now. Popperin, I think. I think. We'll go with it. Instead of Pliskova Georgie, I don't think so. I thought um, the Pui match was a great one. Uh, great energy. Um, Alexei Popperin, one of like one of the players that I would choose to watch now. I think after I've seen him this week, he has got a lot of weapons, great power from the baseline, great skill at the net, control at the net, uh, great pace around the court for a tall player as well. Uh, he's he's really good to watch and didn't quite manage to edge it against Pui there, but uh, the crowd weren't great in the latter stages. They were cheering double faults from Pui, which was obviously putting the pressure on for him even more, but he held on to edge it out the year after, I believe, he lost to Gael Monfils from being two sets to love up. He was two sets to love up on Popperin today, so that's a big mental win for Pui. I don't see him going much further in the tournament, but the more wins he gets, the more time on court he gets, the more likely he's going to be able to find his form more consistently. And he's been trouble to the top players in the past, and we saw today part of why that is. His ability from the front of the court, his serve when he's landing it, is is impressive stuff. And, um, um, you know, I, I would probably have shown that match over Pliskova versus Georgie, to be honest. It was a good match. It was... And also, as well, that match, I believe, had started before Pliskova versus Georgi. So, actually, they did the right thing to finish showing it. It's always very annoying. Unless, I, I would understand if, for example, the world number one was coming on, but I people find it quite annoying when there's a match that's being shown and you've seen a set or so of it, and then the, the broadcasters go, we are now tuning into court, center, center court or court one or whatever, and, and they leave the match and you don't see the completion of it. Um, a good move from them. I, I believe that one was showing first, so it was the right thing to stay with it. Uh, <laughs> Zero smash shots were being compared to the likes of Pete Sampras. What do you reckon? I reckon that I wasn't watching tennis properly when Pete Sampras was playing, so I've only seen highlights and stuff on YouTube, which is sad for me. I didn't see Sampras, I didn't really see Agassi, I didn't see some of the guys a bit before them, but I mean, you can't see them. So I wouldn't be able to compare properly because I've not seen enough of Sampras. Maybe I should YouTube that. Um, for those who did see Sampras and have been watching longer than me, I've been watching about 12 years now, 13. I'm still young. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think. Do you agree? Um, are you a writer or professional speaker of some sort? I wanted to write before I started the whole tennis journalism thing. I just thought I would be like a creative writer or something. Uh, writing was what I loved. And then when I started doing journalism, before I was doing like the whole broadcast thing, I was, I thought that my future was as a tennis writer, tennis journalist, feature writer, opinion writer. I did a lot of opinion pieces. Uh, and then I went to uni and I did more of TV, radio, and a few people suggested that I should uh, go more down this route. And this was kind of what I had. I mean, I still have a passion for both, to be honest, but at the moment I'm doing more broadcasting, radio, obviously I do the YouTube, I do commentary as well, I'm doing some more commentary for WTA TV next month, so yes, uh, I wouldn't call that a professional speaker, but it involves speaking. Are you excited for Federer versus Tsitsipas and Zverev versus Raonic? I'd be anticipating the Raonic Zverev match more. I'm going to look stupid now if Federer actually does get upset, but um, Tsitsipas clearly didn't want to play Federer. He was quite honest and said, obviously, I'd want Taylor Fritz to win. Who wouldn't? I mean, you're in a Grand Slam. Um, so, 
Yeah, I, th I think that Zverev Ranić has the potential to be closer. And Tsitsipas is very talented, don't get me wrong, but um, I'm just not sure he's ready to take out Roger Federer over best of five. I think best of five is key. He's not had that much experience over this format himself against any player, really, because he started breaking through properly a couple of years ago. Zverev has an outside chance at the title. It would be an outside chance. I wouldn't have him as a lead contender, which is funny because he won the ATP finals. But, I mean, five again. It was best of three, not best of five. So there you go. Chilich beat Nadal at the Australian Open last year, but lost to Federer in the final. While Chilich didn't beat Nadal outright, it was a retirement. But, I mean... I can't. It's, I struggle to remember how the match was going, but I feel like they each got at least a set. Um, the team beat Djokovic at the French Open, but lost to Nadal. And the Sun beat Federer at Wimbledon, but lost to Djokovic. Beating two of the big three is the real tough ask. Definitely. And you always see this. I didn't think that Anderson was going to push Djokovic at all after he'd beaten Federer and then had that marathon against Isner, which probably played a part. It's just... The mental thing, I mean, technically beating a top player should give you more confidence, but maybe it puts the pressure on to do it again. Maybe it leaves you, I mean, definitely it would probably leave you more exhausted mentally as well as physically. And so more difficult to, to fully focus for the majority of the match or the entirety of the match. I think it's, I think it's an easier thing to do on the WTA just because of the different way the different levels of consistency, I guess. I mean, you've got Karolina Pliskova, who played brilliantly to beat both the Williams sisters at the US Open in 20... 2016. 2016, she beat them both. So, yes, I, I think it is a tough... It is definitely a tough ask. Oh, every time I scroll down, I go too far. Where are we at? I can't find it. Here we go. <laughs> Monfils and Zvitalina. Um, I wasn't expecting that one either. There you go. Don't you agree that we are witnessing a transition in the WTA where new generation are being competitive and about to take over? I wouldn't say they're about to take over, I'd just say that they're joining the current generation. I don't think that one generation has to rise up and the next generation has to just retire and go down straight away. Uh, you're seeing on the men's tour at the moment, yes, the younger players are rising up. Shapovalov, Chorish, Dimonor, Zverev, that kind of player, that age of player. And yet Federer and Nadal Djokovic still going very strong, still occupying the top three spots as they were 10 years ago. So I don't think it's a case of one group of players rising up and getting rid of the other group. I think it's a case of them rising up and just being in the mix with them. <laughs> Uh, credit to you, Simran, and everyone else who's in Australia and still watching the stream. I have mad respect because you're not going to get much sleep. So, yeah, I know all about the lack of sleep at the moment. Federer's breezy 20-minute first set. Federer, just great on serve. His serve does so much for him. I mean, he's great off the ground as well, obviously. The the forehand, the dictating, um, the coming to the net when he needs to, his anticipation of the points. Um, but that serve with its versatility, honestly, the likes of Isner and Karlovic obviously have the biggest serves, the massive serves, Raonic and Burdic also, very big serves. But what Federer has is a very versatile serve, a very precise serve, a serve that really serves him well when he's down, <laughs> serves him well, pun. Um, but yeah, I think it's a massive weapon for Federer and his biggest problem is going to be if that suddenly stops working, if he stops landing the first serves, because, um, that serve is difficult to deal with and it's part of what makes him so great. <laughs> um, Muguruza, it's hard to say what, what she will do, but I mean... The fact that she came through her most recent match, I think, fairly convincingly. Let's have a check. Yeah, because she was playing to Maya Bashinsky. Now, Bashinsky was playing really well in 2015, 2016. Um, really, I, I think that she... Um, she. I think... I'm really confusing myself now because I think it was a big story because she'd retired, potentially, and then came back. 
Um, and I remember her talking about she had dreams of working in a cafe or something. Then she came back and she made a French Open semi-final. Uh, Bashinsky is quite an unorthodox player. She doesn't go for the power. She's um, she's got a lot of crafty crafty elements to her game. And uh, Muguruza did well to come through that in straights because she had opportunities during the first set that she didn't take and yet she was able to pull it together for the tiebreak, roll through the second set. So personally, I think that uh, Muguruza is looking very good and feeling a bit smug because uh, I predicted this to happen ahead of the season. So whatever happens to Muguruza from here, um, that's great for her moving into the rest of the year because she can take confidence from this in her ability, in, I mean, even if she goes out to Pliskova, she's beaten Konta, who was playing her best tennis. She's beaten Bashinsky, who's coming back to form. So there are confidence-boosting wins to take away from this tournament, whatever happens. Um, oh, thank you for subscribing and thank you for your lovely feedback. I really appreciate it and I appreciate you taking the time to tune in because these videos are long. Like, if you guys dip in and out, I don't mind, but thank you for your questions and, yeah, thank you for taking the time to listen because... Not everyone wants to sit listening to someone ramble for ages. So yeah, thank you very much. So keen for Barty versus Sharapova. Yeah, with the different game styles of both of them. Sharapova with her her power and her forehand. Um, and Barty with her slice, her, her net play, her defending skills, her ability around the court. That's the kind of game styles that when they come together, they make for a good clash. So yes. Mm -hmm. What was was Kyrgios commentating during the Federer match? Did anyone else see that? So I don't always watch with the the commentary on. So and I, I didn't see much of the Federer's latest match live. So in fact, I don't I don't think I saw any of it live. No, I didn't slept through that one because <laughs> just got too much. But yeah, wow. Um, I missed I missed Kyrgios commentating. What do you think? Like, it, it, when Kyrgios is done, will he stick around tennis? Will he? I mean, because he seems to just want to run away at the moment. But I, I don't know. With Kyrgios as a confusing character, I think that he cares a lot more than he will let on. Um, and I always felt that even if he didn't particularly like tennis, he liked winning. He likes being successful. So, yeah, uh, I could write a whole essay on Kyrgios, which he wouldn't like. Sampras jump smashes, nothing like that before or after. Nice. I need to check that out more. <laughs> Simran, who do you prefer, Taylor Fritz or Taylor Swift? Um, never heard Fritz singing, so can't compare. I reckon Taylor's the better singer. So we are like Taylor Swift, not Taylor Fritz. Um, yeah, I could just say Taylor and you wouldn't know who I was talking about. Um... Yeah. Um, who are the three female tennis players, the three male tennis players you think are going to have a breakout year on the WTA Tour and the ATP Tour respectively? The breakout players question again. I can't remember who I've said in the past now. Um, when you say breakout, I guess it's... It's more like going and producing quality for the first time as opposed to coming back. For for example, like Belinda Bencic, who I thought was going to have a good year. Bouchard, even Eugenie Bouchard, who I thought if things opened up for her, she could climb back up the rankings a bit. Um, we're talking about... Um, fair, we're talking about players coming through onto the scene who've... Like Alex de Menor, for example, last year did. Um, I think that Felix Auger Aliasime, who I've spoken about before uh, from Canada, he has the game to do damage. He's around the age and has had some of the results that could uh, work to him breaking through. A uh, Japanese player called Yosu Watanuki, who I've seen on the Challenger Tour, who is 20, who is quite a lot. I mean, he's Japanese, so there are going to be comparisons drawn between him and Nishikori. But uh, he's got such a complete game for a player so young. He just needs to work on executing that consistently full-time and uh having good mental strength i think i saw nishikori say that what um, he thinks watanuki has a better backhand than himself which is big coming from nishikori and then who else on the men's tour i mean it's hard to say because there are there are a lot of promising players 
that I can't remember off the top of my head, but players like Christopher Eubanks, who qualified for the Australian Open, big guy, big serve, um, quite hits his ground strokes in a very easy manner. Uh, he He's good, he's got talent. And then on the women's side, there are so many younger players trying to break through now. Amanda Anisimova absolutely has the talent to step up. Um, if she can get the consistency, not have the injuries, uh, maybe she needs to do a bit more fitness work to work against injuries potentially, but she she definitely has the ability. Um, not sure if many of you remember Cece Bellis. She got her first Grand Slam match win when she was 15 and there was a lot of hype around her. Um, in like, actually, like Amanda Anisimova, she gets a lot of easy firepower. Um, she's I'm trying to see where she's ranked at the moment. Um, but she she can play well, she can move into the court and dominate. She's ranked down at 176 because she has been injured for a while, um, probably maybe even about a year. And due to the fact that she's been injured, she's largely been forgotten about, like Anissimova in the latter part of last year. So when Bellis comes back, she's 19 at the moment, I actually wrote an article on why I thought she was the real deal uh, a few years ago. Um, she's got a great game, and I expect Bellis to to do well when she's not injured. And other than that, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of female players that can do it really, um, especially if yeah, if it opens up for them. Is Halep going to beat both Williams sisters? I would predict if I was pushed to make a prediction, I would predict not, based on the fact that I've got Serena to win the tournament, that Serena's so great mentally, that Serena's been effortless really and dominant so far um but is Halep capable of beating both William sisters absolutely yes do you think Alexander Zverev is going to break out this year with an Australian Open win no sorry not this time um uh, and do you think Naomi Osaka can win another Grand Slam title this year's Australian Open. I think she can. If Serena isn't to win, if she ends up facing Serena in the latter rounds, I mean, that was a very good win for Osaka to come through today against Su Wei She. She was pushed three sets and she was up against a player known for her craft. Um, Su Wei She is quite a unique player. She hits double handed off both sides. Uh, she slices a lot. She's very consistent and put Osaka in trouble. So to come through that is very good for Osaka and. Yeah, she has the she has the confidence. She has the team around her, which is a massive thing. I think she needs that good team around her. Sasha Bayern, her coach, being instrumental. She needs that team. She needs uh, the confidence boosting wins, and she just plays better against uh, the top players. And I think that she's got a draw in place that will allow her to get to that stage where she's playing the elite. So yeah, I think that um, if my picks to win don't get there, I think I th the three leaders for me at the beginning of the event, as I've said, were Serena, Kerber and Osaka. So do you think Daniel Medvedev is underrated? Definitely. I think he is. He's got a great serve, which I don't ever hear talked about. Um, very precise. Uh, a lot. It's quite flat as well a lot of the time. So um, a great starting shot. Uh, he's also got... I think it's because he doesn't have wins over Djokovic, Nadal, Federer that he's underrated because um, people don't really talk about his wins over Vavrenka, for example, at Wimbledon because he's beaten Vavrenka at a slam and that's never mentioned. So I think, yeah, he has a great game off the ground. Uh, he um, is quite consistent and yeah, I think he's underrated. Da, da, da. Simran, I'm rooting for Halep. It would be so awesome for her to win this year. I'd be so happy for a stalker. She looks so promising. I think she's had all straight sets so far. Up until today, yes. Up until Sue She, she had had straight sets and she was looking very comfortable. Um, and that's still a confidence boosting win. It's good for her to have been tested mentally to come through that three setter. Um... <laughs> Honestly, the way Federer and Nadal are playing, Zverev will retire before them. Who knows? Maybe. I mean, Federer, I'm saying Federer into his 40s, probably, if he still wants it. Uh, Nadal, when you're competing that hard, I don't think you ever want to stop. I mean, look at Andy Murray now. His body is pretty much telling him, well, his hip. I mean, because the rest of his body, the frustrating thing for him is saying it's only his hip. The rest of his body 
feels like it could go on, but his hip is essentially saying, maybe it's time to call it quits. And Murray is saying, no, I want more. I want to keep going. So you see this competitive spirit that gets the top players through so much adversity and so, so much pain, really. They're willing to fight through it. During the commentary, Nick Kyrgios said of Roger's forehand, so smooth, literally butter. It's a good description, actually. Get Kyrgios in the commentary box more often. Um, he's, uh, don't know if he did any homework on how to, how to uh, commentate, but nice quote. Mm. I expected Hyun Chung to go. Oh, I've just lost it. Yeah. I expected Hyun Chung to go at least as deep as the quarters, considering the way he dismantled Djokovic in straights last year. That was so impressive last year from Chung. And he'd won the next gen ATP finals, I believe, but don't think anyone expected him to translate it to best of five sets so soon. But he was he was awesome against Djokovic. Um I think because he broke out so soon and didn't really back it up for the rest of the season. There was definitely mental pressure for both him and Kyle Edmund coming into the tournament this year. They were the two breakout players that made the semis last year. And uh, I've got, yeah, Kyle Edmund obviously opened against Thomas Burdick. And I mean, that was a killer draw, killer draw. So yeah, um, it, it was tough. It, it was a tough situation. And now I think that now Chung's got that out of his system maybe he can move on stronger from here take i mean obviously there were a lot of negatives in that loss but just kind of move on um oh, sorry I keep losing where i'm at tell us who's going to end up with the most majors out of the big three i can't tell you i can only guess uh we'll visit the answer again in five years when you hit a million subs oh awesome i mean if if we did one, oh, Simran, petition for Abigail to hit one million by Wimbledon. Ha! <laughs> Telling them what my birthday is. How do you remember? Oh, wait, Australia Day. There we go. That's how you remember. I'm impressed. Thank you. Oh, that would be, yeah, that would be awesome. Um, we'll visit the answer again in five years. If I'm still around in five years, obviously, you never know. Um, tell us who's going to end up with the most majors. Well, uh, the thing is, with the, th with the big three, it's, um... It's kind of going in circles of, um, well, with Federer and Djokovic anyway. Djokovic win a load, then Federer win a load. Now Djokovic is winning a load again. So does that mean Djokovic is going to drop off again and Federer wins a few more? And then Nadal keeps winning the French Open. So you've got Federer and Djokovic kind of juggling the others. And then French Open, Nadal, French Open, Nadal, French Open, Nadal. And then, I mean, if, if Nadal just keeps winning the French Open every year and Federer struggles elsewhere, Nadal could catch up to Federer. Then you've got Djokovic, who's probably going to perform well at Wimbledon and on the hard courts. So now that he's back in form, I mean, given that he's five, four, five years younger than Federer, I mean, there's opportunity for him to catch up. So, oh, I don't know. I don't think I dare predict that because it's too, um, it's too tough. Any of them could do it. Any of the three. I'd be more inclined to go with Federer or Djokovic, I think, but um, possible for any of them. Okay. USTA president left the court once Venus Williams lost her match against Simona Halep. She didn't bother to wait for Simona's reaction speech after the match. I found that unsportsmanlike. I mean, to be fair, she's not under any obligation to do that. Maybe she had a meeting somewhere and she was she had to go to it straight away. Um, you never know, because these people have personal lives as well. You never know what the situation is. Uh, who knows, if Venus had won, she might not have stayed either. So, um, yeah, I can't really speculate too much on these things. <laughs> subscribe to PewDiePie. Is he still winning, by the way? Has he got the most subs at the moment? I don't think he'd gone down. Crazy one. Do you think it's possible that Federer will still be able to maintain his level of play when he's 40 plus, when Nadal and Djokovic are likely to be past their prime due to their game styles? Um... The thing with Federer is, apart from that time in 2016, his body copes incredibly well with the physical aspects of this game. He's not getting injured very much. Um, and so if his energy levels stay up, then, I mean, at the moment, he doesn't show any signs of slowing down. So I think that at the age of 40, he could still be playing well. I just He's just kind of one of a kind in that respect. I don't think Djokovic or Nadal would probably be playing as well at that age, but I can see it happening for Federer. Um, 
Will he win slams past the age of 40? Honestly, that depends on how well and how consistently the younger generation comes through as well. I've always said that I think Alexander Zverev, for example, will win a lot of Grand Slams because when the big guys retire, that will leave an opening. But at the, by the looks of it, at the moment, they're going to keep playing and playing for a while. Not Murray, potentially, but the others. Or even if Murray gives it a break for a couple of years and then comes back, you know, they're just kind of not letting go. So... Um, there is obviously the potential to, for him to win slams past the age of 40, but it's kind of a wait and see game. There one this is I mean my predictions are terrible anyway, but um it gets <laughs> it gets even even worse uh, for predictions when you're predicting years into the future. I mean, there was a, a thing in 2013, I think, when a French magazine predicted the ATP top 10 for five years time and they had Grigor Dimitrov at number one well Dimitrov is doing well at the Australian Open but he'd completely dropped off last year so mm. he was nowhere near number one <clears throat> you just never know yeah I can see Federer playing the next Olympics uh definitely and it's quite funny because when I think I was more easily influenced when I was younger um back when I was very young and I started watching and the only things I really heard about tennis were from the British media who failed to inform me for a while that <clears throat> tennis actually happened outside of Wimbledon and that never really forgave them um <clears throat> but I was kind of when he lost to to Murray at, at the Olympics in 2012 I was really sad for him and I thought oh no Federer might not play another Olympics and he wanted the gold medal so badly um, and yet he's still going and he's still giving himself a shot at these biggest tournaments, you know. So, yeah, I'm never going to write the guy off, you know, when he calls it quits, when he says he's done, then fair enough. But, yeah. What are your views on the young Aussie star, Alexei Popper, in, and his game? Yeah, I spoke about him a bit earlier in the video. I spoke about him in the last video because I saw him. I watched him properly in a match for the first time when he beat... Who did he beat in round two? I'm already forgetting. It was Dominic Team, and he was two sets and a breakup, and then Team retired. Love it. I love his game. It's great. I having watched him this week properly for the first time. I definitely see him shooting up the rankings at some point. He's definitely got the capabilities to be top ten in the future um, if he has the right head game and the right people around him. I believe he can uh, get to slam winning standard. He's he's got so much to his game already at such a young age and it's just bringing that all together consistently and uh, the firepower that he can get sometimes is brilliant. So I'm a big fan of his game. It's great. Um, the reason Federer's body has defied time the way it has is because his game doesn't hurt him. It's like he embodies tennis. I don't know if he plays tennis or tennis plays him. Oh my word, that is such a good quote, really. Uh, because... The, the way he does play is so fluid and he's not letting his opponents kind of run him around and keep him playing for ages. It's not a grinding game. It's a, it's a, it's not always a dominant game either. He can rally, but I mean, he does go for those winners and they look effortless and the serve is his saving grace sometimes. That serve is just brilliant. So I don't know if he plays tennis or tennis plays him. What a quote. Um... Yeah, remember the time Murray played Federer in the Wimbledon finals in 2012, where after his losing speech and he said, I was told I finally had a chance, Roger's now 30 and now a dad. <laughs> 30. All that time ago. Uh, what year is it? 2019. So, oh dear me. Time flies. 2012, seriously, feels like so recent. What do you think of Daniel Collins and can you analyse the Collins-Kerber matchup? Danielle Collins, it's interesting. My first memory of Collins is when she lost to, I think, Laura Robson in the first round of 2012 US Open. And um, I didn't watch her much after that. I kind of thought it was one of those average players with a pretty basic game that she could execute okay. Uh, she played college tennis, I believe, and that kind of... For, for a lot of players that play college tennis, they don't always break through. I mean, you've got John Isner, who's managed it, and one or two others, but they find it more difficult to break into being a consistent one top 100 pro player after they've done college tennis. So um, I think Collins was very impressive in her last match, her upset over uh, Caroline Garcia. She was um, hitting with great depth. She's got a really good forehand. Um, so she, she goes for the power, but I think there are always going to be players who do that 
a bit better than she does. Like she can pack a really good punch and when she's feeling confident, she can get the uh, great margin in her shots. Um, but against Kerber, I think that she might be surprised by how much staying power Kerber has. Like seriously, Kerber was playing a really decent opponent in Kimberly Birrell, an in-form in opponent, and yet she dealt with it incredibly well. She's got so many elements to her game, not just in terms of the effect she puts on the ball, but the way she places the ball and the ball she gets to that some of the other players probably wouldn't be able to get a racket on. So yeah, Kerber's just in great form right now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's the potential, it has the potential to be a good match, but I thought Birrell Kerber did as well, and Kerber kind of whitewashed on that one, so I should just keep this near me. I've got, I've got quite a sore throat at the moment, so. Mm. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, it does have the potential to be decent. What do you think about Anissa Mova? I followed her since Mexico Juniors 2014. She won the final against Katie Swan, and I was disappointed then. But since I see her beating Sabalenka, yeah, she had a great win over Sabalenka. Um, she had the, the firepower again, and the way she opened up the court, and it was, it was textbook tennis really, opening up the court. But the way her shots were so flat and so precise under such pressure, because Sabalenka was hitting hard herself. There was a lot of pace in the rallies, and in the end, Sabalenka's movement just couldn't keep up, whereas Anissa Mova's movement was brilliant. She was she would stop and she'd be straight back. It, those shots in tennis where you're running side to side at the baseline and you have to make adjustments when someone's about to rock the wrong foot you and you have to turn around. She was just, she was doing brilliant. She was doing really, really well, Anissa Mova. And I, I think that she's got, you know, the she's got the ability on her ground stroke. She's got the ability in her movement. She's got the great serve as well for a girl so young. So yeah, definitely good. Um, out of the big three, who would you say was the best at their peak? I really struggle with this the best thing because there are so many different aspects. So in terms of physical game, I take Federer's. In terms of the mental aspect, Djokovic, I think, long when it comes to long-term dominance, has probably been the best mentally. But then you have Nadal, who's great at turning around matches when he's on the losing end, when he looks like he might be going down. So... <sighs> It, it comes down to loads of different categories, so I don't think... I mean, if someone was to ask me who's the greatest player of all time, I would probably say Roger Federer, because Grand Slam titles don't lie, because his his game when he's on song is so brilliant, and so he can do so many different things with it. He, he, he can hit winners, he can play defensively, he can come forward, he's just got such a good feel for it. Um, I think when a lot of people think tennis, they think Roger Federer, and there's a reason for that. Um, but, you know, there there are so many amazing things about each of them. I always say that, you know, Roger Federer is the, the grass court player. Rafael Nadal, he's the clay court player. And Novak Djokovic is the hard court player. And even though they can all play on each surface, they kind of have a name for themselves on those particular surfaces, I think. So... Yeah, I I always think there should be more grass court tournaments. I mean, it's difficult because of the the length of each part of the season in the calendar and countries that would able to be able to host such an event due to weather conditions and everything. But no, the grass season should definitely be longer. It's so short, so short. It's ridiculous. How do you feel about Alex de Menor? Man, he was playing so, so well. It just happened to be Nadal, who is Nadal plays like his life depends on every point. It's so true because I didn't think Demonor played badly at all. He was really throwing everything at Nadal. Even in those closing stages, he came out with some phenomenally constructed rallies. Uh, I think one time he made Nadal smash about three times before he actually finished the point because he's just so relaxed and so focused and reads where the ball is going and then is really fast getting up to it and doing what he wants to do. Uh, he, even though he's so small, he can get good power on the ball, and because he moves so well, he can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the top players from the baseline. Nadal was just Nadal. He just stepped it up. He identified the key moments. He anticipated what Dumanor was going to do a lot of the time. Uh, 
I mean, it's hard, really. You'd have to look back and really try and pinpoint what Dimonor was doing wrong. I mean, sometimes a player can be playing really well and they can just be off for a couple of points and that's all it takes. Those top players will penalise that. And I think he did... He really demonstrated... I can't think of what I'm trying to say. He He gave a really good... I can't, I, it's a phrase I use all the time and yet I can't think of it at the moment. Um, but basically he showed what he was about. It was impressive. Uh, he put his heart and soul into it. And it's a shame for him that the scoreline wasn't any different to the scoreline at Wimbledon. Because even though it was a similar story in both, Jim and Orr fighting hard and not getting there, I thought he was even better at the Australian Open. So yeah, it's a shame for him that Nadal was just so great. Do you think Murray's retirement announcement was handled pretty badly by all parties? 100% yes. There is a real possibility he may come back next year. We'll be very awkward with all the... Um, I can't pronounce that, I never can. Uh, well, I, basically all the, all the tributes and um, the... the. I mean, it was all premature. It was so premature. When Murray... I wish I'd been there at the time when Murray announced... He never, I've said it before, I'll say it again, he didn't say retirement, he didn't say he was retiring, he didn't mention the word retire. He just said that his hip wasn't great, he was obviously very tearful, very emotional, and he said that when asked if there was the possibility the Australian Open could be his last tournament, he said, yes, there was, because of course there was. For any, to for any player, there is a chance that their next tournament could be their last, because life is tough, life is rough, anything could happen, nothing is a guarantee. So, and then with Wimbledon, he just, he said, at this point in time, with the way I'm feeling, this is where, at this point in time, I might like, I don't, I can't even remember the words he used, but he didn't say retire, he might like to, to finish there or something. Um, but the thing is, Murray is so competitive, and honestly, as much as he fights and as much as he's gone through, he, I, I do think he can be a bit dramatic sometimes. Like um, on court when he's playing, you know, he can be fine between, he can be fine playing points, and then if if he lost a point or something, he'd kind of grab his back or grab his leg or something. It's something I've seen over the years. I've noticed it since I was a young child when watching Murray play. Um, so he can kind of maybe be caught up in the emotion of something. Um, he's worn his heart on his sleeve a lot and I just wasn't ready to completely believe that it was the end because it seemed strange to me anyway. It seemed very sudden and while the big four can't go on forever, I thought, you know, uh, this is Murray. We've seen Nadal, Federer, Djokovic all fight past injuries with utter willpower and utter desire to come through and, you know, even if Murray takes two years out or something with with having an operation or something. We've seen Juan Martin Del Potro spend virtually three years at the sidelines and then come back from a wrist injury, get to an Olympic final, get to a Grand Slam final. So it all depends on how hungry Murray is and he definitely doesn't seem ready to retire. So 100% everything was really premature in that sense. And for them to roll that retirement reel after he'd said that he would try and come back to Australia. It was very much a sense of, oh, we've spent so much time putting this together. And I felt sorry for, I think it was Miles McLagan who was doing the on-court interview because he'd clearly he would have been told beforehand that you're going to talk to Murray a bit and then you're going to roll this video. So he didn't have the chance to kind of, he didn't know that Murray was going to say that and he didn't have the, the chance to confer with anyone and talk about what they should do. He just had to go for it on court. So obviously they did what they'd pre-planned but it looked kind of silly that Murray had said, oh, I'm going to try and come back. And then they said, here is everyone wishing you a happy retirement, basically. So yeah, it's been a mess. It's been dramatic. It's been messy. It's been the media trying to capitalize on the story and how high profile and big it's been and get clicks, which is, I mean, people have to earn their living. You know, people have to run a business. So I understand that, but it's annoying. So yeah. Hmm. Oh, I've lost where I am again. We will get there. We keep doing it. Okay. Um, not to start a drama, but I'm really personally not a fan of Caroline Wozniacki because she never gives someone else credit 
for no reason saying salty things about Sharap over in a conference. I missed that. Um, Caroline Wozniacki, Caroline Wozniacki actually has a very good reputation um, behind the scenes. She has a lot of friends on tour. Everyone seems to think she's very sweet. Uh, I mean, the times I've met her, she seemed a nice enough girl. But I mean, there was that situation with her, in her match with Monica Puig, I think last year, either Indian Wells or Miami, uh, where she said that she was getting death threats from Puig's fans after she'd lost or something. And I think Puig got really annoyed and, and angry um, about that. I mean, because her and Wozniacki were friends, but I think there was some, some, I mean, I don't want to speculate, but I think there was some, some tension after that. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're professional play tennis players, you know, it's tough for them to lose and it's never going to be a good look to be bitter in defeat and um, it's never going to come off well and it's not excusable but I mean it is tough um, I mean she was defending champion it was the first time she'd won a slam last year so but no I, I missed um, whatever was said in the press conference Who do you think will make the semis, WTA and ATP, based on what you saw so far? I'll have a look at that and try and answer it on the next video, which, um, I mean, if I did a preview and predictions video, I'd be predicting anyway, so maybe we'll leave that one for a, for a closer date, because I don't know the draws off the top of my head at the moment, I can't, it's bursting up here, I can't remember everything. <laughs> okay. Who do you think will be the first player out of the next gen to win a slam? Um, Zverev is the front runner, but if he goes so long without being able to break through, that could be detri detrimental to his mentality and the way he approaches things. So, um, I mean, it should be, it should technically be Zverev, but is he next gen anymore? Because he turns 22 this year, and I think kind of their next gen age range went up to the age of 21 or something. So... I mean, I think Shapovalov will win slams. I think Dimonor is capable of winning slams. So, yes, we will see. Okie doke. Right, I think we'll have to call it that. I didn't see the video. Security guard who did this job despite the person breaking rules being Roger Federer. I'm not sure. I missed that completely. Tell me about it afterwards. Um... But yeah, okay, I think we'll have to hold it there because I've been going for one and a half hours, which I didn't intend to do. Uh, it's quarter to four here and I have quite a busy rest of the day. So I'll wrap up. Thank you for joining in and thank you for um, the new subscribers, those who've told me they subscribed during uh, the video. Thank you for those who've watched who I'm, I mean, I'm aware of you because I can see the number on the screen, but not everyone's left comments, I know, but thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, let me know um, either on Twitter or in the comments for this video once it's all wrapped up and available to watch back. Let me know if you'd like to see another live Q&A after the fourth round or if you'd be more interested in seeing um, a preview and predictions video and I'll see what I can do about that. <laughs> I'm kind of dreading next week but at the same time I mean it's going to be great tennis but it's going to be busy as well. So okay. Thank you. Have a great day too. Uh, great that you all tuned in. Thank you for supporting the channel as ever and keep enjoying the tennis. And uh, thank you guys. Thanks. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you next time. Bye.